Welcome back. Facebook is tightening its live streaming rules. The social media giant announcing a one strike policy vowing to temporarily restrict users who break company guidelines. This move is in response uh, to uh, the live streaming of the Christchurch massacre in New Zealand. Joining me right now is Elevation Partners co founder, managing director, and author of Zucked Waking Up to the Facebook Catastrophe, Roger McNamee, a long time and early investor in Facebook, who's become over the last year, as you know, two years, uh, much more active and cautious on this company. Great to see you, Roger. Maria, it's always great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. So, what about this tightening of the rules at Facebook? Is this enough? Does this address your concerns? It, it does not. What I love, and I really, I really support Mark in his engagement in the issues. He really does understand there's no place to hide any longer. But they're doing classic public relations of conceding things that don't matter, that won't actually change the outcome, to try to protect the business model that's really what is at the heart of the problem. Well, what are they going to do? I mean, how, how do you, that is the business model, right? It is. Though, I mean, the business model is dependent on getting people's engagement. And by promoting the stuff people engage with, you're naturally going to be promoting hate speech. You're going to promote disinformation. You're going to promote conspiracy theories. And they make a lot of money because of promoting that stuff. So what they want to do is find a way to make the PR problem go away without actually having to get rid of the content that causes the problem in the first place. And in this case, you know, the notion that people are going to be able to police this and get it down before any harm is done is ridiculous. You have to find a way to take away the incentive. It's all about... You know, status is what people are looking for. And so these extremists, these terrorists, are looking to use Facebook to get status by promoting their, their act of terror online. So it's the fact that you can do it that is the problem. Yeah, I mean, the bigger issue, I guess, is this company has an enormous amount of power, more so than a lot of people understood. Same with Google. This is why Chris Hughes, one of the founders of the exactly. company, writes a piece in the New York Times last week that got a lot of play, a lot of conversation about it, that it's time to break up Facebook. Well, Chris makes an absolutely essential point about the power situation because Facebook and Google are not elected, and yet they have more impact on our democracy than anything has ever had in the past. They have more impact on our public health, on our privacy, and frankly, on the economy. And the core issue here is what are the best ways to, to, to handle that? And I want to use antitrust to, in order to create opportunity for competitive models to happen. I want to get back to entrepreneurship. You know, you and I have known each other a long time, back from the days when Silicon Valley was about small companies doing amazing new things. And now we're totally dependent on these monopolies. But the other thing you have to do is go after that business model. We have to get these companies out of the world of, they're basically using surveillance and purchasing data and trading data to get to know everything about us. They make these digital voodoo dolls of each and every one of us. We have no idea how much data they have. We have no idea what they're doing with it. And we are so dependent on these products without realizing that they're manipulating our behavior. And that has to stop. It's just, it's not American. It's, that's kind of the Chinese way of doing things. And I just don't want to see us going down that path. What have you heard back, uh, you know, in response to your criticism from the company? You wrote a whole book about it, Zucked. Well, uh, it's been getting incredible play since, since give, you published it. I give Mark a lot of credit because he is engaging in the conversation, but he's got really good PR handlers who are saying to him, Mark, make this little concession here, it'll go away. Make that little concession there, it'll go away. And fortunately, the flow of news has been so intense that People have not been satisfied with the little moves that they've made. But unlike Google, at least they're in the conversation. Yeah, that's Google's true. Google's trying to pretend, hey, none of this has anything to do You're with us. You're absolutely right. Which is complete nonsense. Yeah. And so I look at this as, as you know, in, in their shoes, probably a lot of CEOs would handle it the same way they're doing it. But I want them to sit there and realize they succeeded beyond their wildest dreams. This is an opportunity for Mark to be the hero of his own story. Yeah. And, and just to be clear, even though you have been sort of cautious and negative and, and, and speaking out about the issues around the company, you really haven't sa sold much stock. I mean, no, well, the, criti the critical little, thing right? from, yeah, the critical thing I continue to have, a, it's continues to be by, by far my largest position. And the key thing is, I don't think this is about the people. I am not critical of Mark. I'm not critical of Cheryl or of Larry. It's about the business model. It's about the business model. It's about the culture. And it's about this notion that somehow they're entitled to uh, essentially convert everybody's human experience into data mm. and then use that to manage our lives. Because we all go to them for information. What we don't realize is they're using their control of the menu to control the choices available to us. Mm. 
and that's not a good the, idea. We talk a lot about China and how China is, you know, yeah. tracking its citizens, yeah. facial technology. Yeah. They've got, uh, you know, all this data on everybody. The closest thing to China in this country is Google and then Facebook. And my point is, they say you can't regulate this because we have to compete with China. I go, why do we want to compete with China in behavioral manipulation? We don't. We want to apply AI and all this technology to all the things you can do to make humanity better off. What's the fear around AI? Well, the, the, the legitimate fears are come in two different areas. One is that you train artificial intelligence with data from the real world. So if you're not really careful, you reproduce all the problems of the real world without a human being to go and complain to. So if you sit there and think about this, we've had huge issues in, um, in corporations for recruiting with resume applications that retain the real world biases against women. Right, against there's older implicit people. bias right in there. Exactly. And my point is, you have to be really careful and it's doable. The other problem with AI is that they're almost inscrutable. It's, it's almost impossible to tell until you do something when you start at the beginning what's going to come out at the end. And so you sit there and say, well, we can get an AI to drive a car. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there and going, hang on. Yeah. Driving cars with humans on the road is really complicated. And we cannot count on these things to get it right without an awful lot of testing. I don't think we're going to see a fully autonomous driverless car on the road for a decade. I, mean, I, I know well, what Elon Musk hope, is saying. I'm not I, buying it. I'm, I I'm hope not. we don't. Yeah. I mean, if we do, it'll be very, very dangerous. Let me ask you about Microsoft. The company yeah. is sounding the alarms this morning, uh, a warning of a monster computer bug that could be used as a cyber weapon. Uh, what do you know about this, and how do these problems keep popping up? Well, the, the issue that you have with Microsoft and, frankly, with all the gigantic web platforms, is they are so huge and they have so much out there that inevitably things fall through the cracks. Microsoft has been patching and upgrading Windows forever and this bug is about older versions of Windows. And you know the sad part? That means government agencies and corporations that don't upgrade regularly are the ones who are going to be victimized by this. So it's in the worst possible places. And now that everybody knows the bug is there, there is a real risk. So it's super important that anyone who has those old versions of Windows upgrade immediately, put the patch in place. And, um, you know, the thing with te computer technology is it is far more risky than we've allowed for. And we have to budget both the expense and the energy to keep these things current and protected. We've reported on this a lot because Steve Ballmer came on the show and, and told me and confirmed to me that 90% of the companies in China use the Microsoft operating system, 1% pay for it. Exactly. It's, a, it's, a, it's a loss of $10 billion a year for Microsoft. When it comes to China IP theft, you know, this is the big issue. It in is terms a huge of, issue. Uh, the, the president's pushing back using, you know, tax. I just want to point out that April retail sales worse than expected. It was down uh, two tenths of a percent. We were expecting retail sales to be up two tenths of a percent. So this China fight uh, is one thing that people are talking about. Whether or not it's going to impact the economy, we don't know. But April retail sales down two tenths of a percent uh, for the month. That is a uh, worse than expected number. And markets are down this morning. They were already down going into it. But the big issue here, the president's using tariffs. The real elephant in the room, as you know, is IP theft, the forced transfer of technology. Oh, and and, and it, in my mind, it's not just IP theft. The forward-looking risk is the notion that they bring their uh, behavioral manipulation, their what they call the social credit application, into other countries around the world, including the United States, and I don't think we want to allow that. So I believe that having a better reciprocal relationship with China requires holding to, to a much higher standard on intellectual property. Mm. And realistically, we have built our economy around buying stuff from China. We need to get back to making a lot more stuff here. We need to get back to investing and in more consuming less. Yeah. I don't know that the country is emotionally prepared to consume less, but if you're worried about China, that's got to be a big part of the answer. Yeah. And because right now you go into a retail store, what is it like in a Walmart? Like 90 percent of what's there do you, do is you made think in China. China's economy gets impacted more than the U.S. economy from this fight. It does, but we both get hurt. Yeah. And it's, and it's needless. Again, the retail sales are down two tenths of a percent versus an estimate of up two tenths of a percent. X autos, they were up one tenth of a percent versus an estimate of up seven tenths of a percent. Not a, a good number this morning on retail sales. Roger, it's great to see you. Maria, always a pleasure. Thank you, Roger.